I want to start with uh, just acknowledging the people who are coming to the meeting who are not housing partnership people. Alex, I just asked you um, before the recording started, and could you just say one more time, just introduce yourself and say who you are. I'm sorry, I kind of um, jumped the gun there. Yes, that's no problem. I'm just, as I said, I'm with the press, I'm with Daily Hampshire Gazette, and I'm just covering this meeting as I feel it is of interest uh, to our publication. Okay, thanks a lot, Alex. Um, and then the other person here is Laura Baker from Valley CPC. Um, Laura, you're gonna give a presentation on 27 Crafts Ave. Um, Gwen has joined us now, hi Gwen. Um, so there are no public comments, Alex is listening. Laura is gonna present shortly. Um, we could, since Laura's here now, we could start with Laura and move the approval of the minutes to after Laura's presented. Is that all right with everybody? Makes sense. Okay, great. So we're gonna start with you, Laura. You're first on the agenda. You have the floor. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure always to be with the Northampton Housing Partnership on a hot, steamy evening in July. Um, Keith, can you uh, enable me to share? You did. Okay, awesome. So I really came tonight to give you folks kind of a preview of a project that Valley's starting to work on uh, in collaboration with the city of Northampton and Jones Witset Architects. Um, I did bring a PowerPoint presentation that I can run through um, with you know, information points and visuals. And then of course, we always wanna hear your questions and comments uh, about the project. So let me see if I can bring that up. How are we doing? Good. And Laura, before you start, I just want to acknowledge somebody else from the public has joined us. I'm having trouble seeing the small print in the light I'm in. I think it's Jada, is that right? That's the nickname, but technically it's Joella. They call me Jada. And it's Tarbun, Tarbun okay. Springfield, where I live in Northampton. Okay, very good. Are, do you have a public comment you wanted to make or would you like to hear the presentation and just join us for that? Can I join you for that? I'm so uh, anxious sure to hear what you have. Absolutely, yes. Okay, Lori, you're really on this time. Great. Yeah. How's the sound? Can you folks hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so again, the project that we wanted to, to start to share with you tonight is located at 27 Crafts Avenue uh, in Northampton. Uh, for people who may not know exactly where this is, if you can see my cursor, it's this yellow dot here. Uh, it's probably a somewhat familiar uh, section of town. It's right behind City Hall and next to the town office building. It's across Crafts Avenue from Provisions and across kind of a driveway from the bus station and Bombay Royale. Um, partly we're showing this uh, so that you can see kind of proximity to different things that are in downtown, um, really walk, walkable to multiple bus locations in town, also extremely close to the bike trail, as well as less than half a mile from the railway station that's over here. Um, but mostly what we're excited about is just how walkable this location is to everything that is available in downtown. Um, so the way this kind of originated is the city of Northampton identified this as a potential property. It's owned currently, or actually not anymore, but until very recently owned by the city of Northampton. Um, initially, I think the first look at this parcel was uh, in consideration for the resiliency hub. And then it became kind of a look at it for a combination of a hub and potentially some low income housing. Uh, and then it evolved as the Resiliency Hub found its new home uh, in a church building. Uh, we began looking at it strictly for affordable housing. So again, the city's identified any locations that it can and favored this one because of its downtown location. Um, one of the um, outgrowths of the panhandling study that was done a few years ago 
showed that a majority of those folks were unhoused. Uh, the city council approved uh, this parcel to be uh, put out through a request for proposals to seek uh, an affordable housing developer and Valley submitted a proposal and was selected. Um, I'm going to show you some better images as we go along of exactly where this is. It's our number one question. Where is this? Oops, sorry. Um, and so you can see at present, uh, what we're showing is down here currently are about five uh, parking spaces used by the building department. There is this uh, concrete uh, stairwell that goes up the hill to the upper city hall parking lot. And then this is kind of a steep uh, grassy grade going along here. There's the parking along Crafts Avenue. So the city had some requirements in seeking a developer. Um, they had obtained a significant grant and they wanted to essentially um, have a good say in the design of the building. Uh, they were the ones who solicited and hired the architect, which is Jones Witset. Uh, they stipulated that the design must meet passive house standards, that the building ultimately cannot use any fossil fuels in operations, and that the developer must create a minimum of 20 affordable units at or below 60% of the area median income with the majority of those being for 30% um, AMI, which is extremely low income, and that also these units have a homeless preference. The city's primary agenda, kind of again, linking up with that panhandling uh, study was to create housing for people who are unhoused. I see someone with a hand raised. Do we wanna do questions now or, or go to the end? Um, can this question wait until later or or does it need to be asked now? I'm not sure who is raising their hand. Gwen. I went away. Thank you, Gwen. Okay, very good. <laughs> we'll, we'll give you another chance. Totally. Um, yeah. And then if a developer did not build or at least show progress toward building within five years, this, the parcel will, will revert to the city. So we have kind of a time limit. Uh, what we are currently proposing, and again, those of you who've watched us go through pro projects before know that, you know, we started a preliminary scheme uh, program, and then sometimes it um, changes over as we go forward over time. So currently we are designing for 30 studio apartments, primarily for single adults and couples. Five of these are currently designed as handicapped accessible. We're earmarking 20 as having a preference for unhoused persons who are very low income and 10 for low to moderate income tenants. And then down below, you'll see those definitions for a very low income single person. That's that 30% AMI standard. They must earn below $20,950 per year. And then in that moderate income, single person must earn below $41,880,000 per year. The uh, very low income uh, units, we tend to try to pair with a rental subsidy so that those tenants would pay 30% of their income for rent. Whereas in the moderate income category, we would do a market study and establish a below market rent, but it would be a fixed rent. Um, we're trying to capture two primary different tenant groups. One is people who can't afford, who, who have no housing currently. And then also people who might be working in downtown Northampton and just simply priced out of housing in the downtown area. So um, as part of our program, we're proposing to have some on-site staff to assist tenants, um, including a part-time resident services coordinator and a part-time property manager. So a property manager essentially acts as a landlord, takes care of the property, manages lease up, takes care of repairs, the resident services coordinator's job is really to link tenants to community-based services and or to bring those community-based services into the property. So we are fortunate in downtown Northampton that we have a multiplicity of providers who are delivering health, mental health, sobriety support, and other services to tenants and other residents. Um, this particular site is walking distance to many of these services, including meals by MANA, the service sense in that outpatient clinic on Pleasant Street, the Northampton Recovery Center, and many others. So we wanted to highlight some of the benefits to the city. Um, it adds affordable housing for people right within the downtown. Uh, it increases tax revenue. So currently the parcel, when it was owned by the city, was tax exempt. After it's developed, it will pay taxes according to its assessed value. 
uh, it eliminates risk to the city from deteriorated stairs and retaining wall. So once the connecting ramp was put in place from the lower parking lot up to Pulaski Park, the city had no particular need for this set of stairs and actually took some photos the other day. So they are they are crumbling at this point. And so the city doesn't uh, intend to invest to improve those stairs. And also the retaining wall, which is uh, fundamental to supporting the city hall annex is also deteriorated. So this is kind of a two birds with one stone approach to this building will essentially act as a retaining wall for those other buildings and the upper parking lot, as well as providing housing. Uh, creates fossil fuel housing uh, stock, uh, locates this housing in a highly walkable transit friendly location and increases foot traffic for downtown businesses. So this is our number question. Number one question is where is this building going to go? So this is a, a, a good look at kind of pinpointing the corners of this building. Um, it would again replace the parking here. It would replace all of this kind of failing retaining wall and um, stair structure. This is some views that you're probably all familiar with of nearby businesses. This is Crafts Avenue. Uh, this is looking down at the, the bus station building and the city hall annex. Uh, this is Bombay Royale across the street. Again, looking up at city hall from a couple different vantage points. Uh, this is a site plan. It's pretty simple um, in terms of really, it's a very small lot. This is a, a classic kind of urban infill lot. And so the property lines of the building are very close to the property lines of the parcel. Um, so there will be a little bit of landscaping that we add. There will be an entryway that comes in about two and a half stories up here off of that upper city uh, hall parking lot, but the main entry will be down here uh, facing Crafts Avenue. And then we have a little bit of a side entry here for people to bring bikes in, for people to bring trash out, things like that. There is no parking associated with this particular parcel. Um, this is a work in progress. Um, this is a preliminary rendering of what this building might look like. Um, so again, here is bus station, Bombay Royale. You all know City Hall is here, Provisions is here. So again, the main entry here facing Crafts Avenue. Um, existing parking along Crafts Avenue will be retained, so no loss of parking there. Uh, building, building department will be um, relocated to other uh, city-owned parking spots. Um, and because this is a fairly tall building, it's a total of six floors. It's broken up essentially into two sections. So this front section has four stories and then you kind of start to lose some of the height in the back of the hill that comes down. And then you can see about four and a half stories are kind of poking up on the back side. And then, you know, there's a pretty severe grade sloping down this way. So this would be a view looking down Crafts Avenue. This is a view if you were standing in the city hall upper parking lot looking at the building. And this is a view if you were standing kind of on the corner of Crafts Avenue and Main Street looking at city hall, kind of seeing the building now in kind of showing behind city hall. Uh, the floor plans, essentially the first floor, which is to your far left, the ground floor, uh, does not have any residential units, partly because it's kind of bunkered into the hillside there. Um, Sorry. So it has offices, it has kind of a main common meeting area, uh, it has uh, indoor bike storage, other kinds of storage, uh, bathroom, and then the gray uh, square in the back is primarily for mechanical systems. And then you go up to floors two through four and you start to see this layout of studios kind of ringing around where there are windows. Uh, the building will have an elevator, we'll have two stairwells, and laundry facilities right now are planned for each floor of the building. And then as you get up to the fifth and sixth floor, it again, it steps back. So we will have an outdoor balcony area here, as well as another common area here, and then a uh, kind of fewer number of units on these top two upper floors. Sorry for the quality of this, whoops, quality of that one. Um, this is essentially a typical studio. Average size is 327 square feet. 
Um, you can see kind of you enter, you have a full bathroom to one side, you have a kitchen laid out to the opposite side, little area for you know eating, a nice generous closet, and then you have a sleeping, kind of open sleeping living area. Um, part of my meeting with you folks tonight is um, one step in the community outreach that we intend to do for this development. So we have a variety of stakeholders, including abutters and neighbors. We've been doing kind of door-to-door -door visits to the businesses along Crafts Avenue over the last couple of weeks. We have planned a presentation for the Downtown Business Association and also a group presentation for abutters. Uh, city departments, the planning department and the mayor's office have been kind of reaching out to the different departments that will be impacted primarily during the construction of this building. Uh, we'll be presenting to Northampton Historical Commission uh, in July uh, because this site, even though it's not an existing building, it is within a National Historic District. So the idea is to build something that is compatible and does not create any kind of negative adverse impact on the surrounding historic district. And then other stakeholders, Housing Partnership Yourselves, uh, Friends of Hampshire County Homeless, the local YIMBY group, the municipal light participants, local churches, et cetera, folks who might be interested in the creation of affordable housing. And that is it. I can always pop it back up if we have questions about the visuals. So there were several questions that were put in the chat. Um, do you want to ask those out loud at this point? Sure. Uh, let's see, Gwen says, I wonder what the AMI is. Uh, so we, we talked about 30% and primarily 30%, some at 60%. Oh, you were asking what it is, area median income. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just reading down. Uh, what is the plan for sidewalks around the new building? So there would essentially be one sidewalk um, and it would be a step back, a generous sidewalk area in front of the building. Um, kind of facing the bus station, uh, a little bit of a, uh, it's no more than a pathway, honestly, going up Crafts Avenue. Um, there will be a new crosswalk going over. So really we want people to walk up the business side of Crafts Avenue. Um, and then if people exit near the upper city hall parking lot, there would be a walk, they would connect to the walkway that takes you around that parking lot. Uh, tenant parking. So this site is far too small to have parking. Um, we think that that will be one of the questions that comes up quite a bit during permitting. Um, you may know central business doesn't require any parking uh, for residential units. Um, what we find when we serve these population groups is that a majority of the tenants won't have cars. Um, and so, and the other thing we notice about this site is it's extremely close to a lot of public parking. Um, there's long-term parking kind of behind the roundhouse. There's long-term parking in the parking garage. So to the extent that we have tenants who have cars, we assume they'll, they'll make provision in those um, nearby lots. Uh, I thought the building staff city positions I used to see as when I went to, oh, so you're thinking the building next door to this site, um, which is called the city hall annex. Yes. So directly, if you're facing this site to the left, there's an existing uh, multi-story brick building that's also kind of buried into the hillside and that building remains. Um, we're trying to coordinate some work with them on improving their building because they're having some water issues. Um, so this may be an occasion to make improvements to that building, but those departments and functions will remain in that city building. Can I ask a question too, along with yes. that? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, you know, I, um, I'm i just thinking, first of all, I have to apologize if I'm not saying the politically correct thing. I know people say unhoused people. I'm sorry, I just remember rallying when people, they say I'm homeless, not hopeless, you know? So I'm sorry, that was the empowering word that I was like home, homeless, not unhoused. I mean, I would think where I live in this unhoused is not big, but anyway, I don't want to get into all the political. There's nothing. Listen, there's nothing to be sorry for. We're so glad you're here. Please just speak your mind and ask. Oh, okay. Yeah. Say sorry. anything you want. We are totally uh, accepting of that. Yeah, I'm. I'm not very uh, apologetic. It's a little southern thing. But what I wanted to say is, I, you know, I think about. I can talk about Savo House. 
Salvo House, we have a lot of people who we've helped come from the streets here. And it is a very common thing. I don't know so much about McDonald's, but I have heard it's like that, that we walk in and people who were formerly homeless, they will bring their friends in on very frigid, cold nights. And yep. I have stepped over people, scared me, you know, because sometimes I try to go to the gym at 530, but I'd, I'd be walking over people. And if I said, guys, you can't do this, they would look at me like, how could you do that? They could freeze and die outside. So you're in a proximity to Pulaski Park. Yep. And, and I know people who sleep and in Pulaski Park. So I'm just saying, it's in my opinion, I think it's a wonderful idea. I think you heart is really there. But I wonder if we're going to shift people there to congregate. Um, and that's a concern. And then I think here when we have uh, residents, it's almost like somebody, oh, I used to be a head resident at Mount Holyoke. And when first year students came in, we work with them for a whole year to get acclimated to this is what you do. Here's this, this. So we don't have that. And do you have that somewhere? So people can't go and then people say, you can't give them nothing. They just like that. Da, da, da. I don't want that. I don't want something to fail without all the perimeters looked at to help people transition. And I can just see it from what I've experienced here. It's very likely that it's going to be a um, squatting place. And I just want to interject something, Joella, I believe, because I recently went back and read some minutes that you're a member of the um, Northampton Housing Authority Board, right? That's my twin, but yes. <laughs> okay. And that is how you come to know so much about what is going on here in Northampton with affordable housing. So thank you. I just wanted to put you in context with, um, with the other people here who may not know, know anything about you. I know three people. Keith, I just got your uh, email today and I'll give you my survey soon. Of course, I know Eduardo Cancel. He is. Yeah. And then I know Gwen. She's a Hampshire college, uh, college student. And everyone at Gordon, you're a cutie patootie, but I don't know you and Carmen. Yeah. Yeah. No. OK. The rest of us are obviously members of the housing partnership. Um, I think that your questions are really important. And I wondered, Laura, if you had a response to what Joella was saying. Sure. No, I think they're all fair points. I think this is not our first property, um, Joella, where we've taken people who've not had housing, who are homeless, and given them housing. So we've been operating housing like that for over 20 years uh, oh. in a variety of locations in the city and in Florence. So we've got two locations in Florence. Um, we had two in Northampton, one recently got converted. Um, so we're well aware that uh, people who are coming out from living on the street may have friends that they want to bring with them. Um, for me, that's a manage management issue um, in terms of, you know, setting house rules for people. Um, I think one of the advantages of having a resident services coordinator on site, that person is a little bit of a social worker type. Um, to also redirect folks who may not be tenants, but may also need services. Um, the part of the reason the city is establishing the resiliency hub was, I think, to give people a place to be during the days where so they may not be congregating at Pulaski Park, they may not be downtown. Now, people will go where they go. I don't think you can tell people to go to any specific one place. But I think the city would say that is their attempt to solve that issue that they're observing in the community. And then this is part of a different solution for people who need you know, permanent housing uh, that's in a walkable location. Um, I would say, let's see, what else did you mention? Can I respond to that? Yes. Well, I just would like you to know, and, and, and I specifically mentioned um, Savo House and uh, Sa uh, McDonald's House. I don't see that particular problem that I mentioned. I'm told it's not as uh, prevalent in uh, Fort Sander in, uh, or other places, but we have just what you're talking about, and it hasn't helped. As a matter of fact, for a decade, I pay about $300 a month to get my mail somewhere else. Because if you have your mail there, unless that residence, uh, remember, I was a head resident at Mount Holyoke, so I was there all the time. Unless yeah. uh, resident services and management are there, uh, living there, that we may want to consider that option. Um, we have a neighborhood watch 
And it is taking a lot for the neighborhood watch to find after maybe the last four years to say, uh, you're having this person come here and, and they'll sneak in too, bless their heart. But to say, if you do that, that's that's your your lease is at jeopardy because you're breaking the rules. But it is almost like spying on each other and it gets a lot of tension going on. I mean, people know I care about folks. I'm always trying to feed them and help them, but they say it's cold outside. You want someone to freeze outside. And it's a really, and they said, he helped me when I was on the street. So we have that here with all the services that you just talked about. Yeah. So if you have so, something, I really want to know how it works. So uh, the best comparable that we have, sorry, Gwen, I'll just say one more thing is um, Sergeant House, which is at 82 Bridge Street, which is 31 studio apartments. Mm -hmm. It's almost identical in size. Okay. Uh, it has a similar preference for folks who are homeless. Now, not to say that it's a perfect world and there's never anything that comes up, but I have not heard the severity of um, issues that that you're describing um, at this other property. So Sorry, let's Gwen. be sure. Yeah, Gwen, go ahead. And a lot of people have questions. So Gwen, you're next, then Gordon. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of parking, the one thing I thought about was if I was a home care worker who you know, has a, a client here, yep. the parking is going to be really, really tough. Um, and then the other thing I was thinking was um, of a gathering place, the importance of a gathering place, because as, as Jada has said, you know, this is going to be a congregational place. And so it would be important to have some kind of a community room. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm always going to say, where's the green? Like, where's that connection to the natural environment? Where's that ability for people to be able to tend to something as they're learning newly how to tend to themselves? Yeah. And so um, I think that's important, um, especially when it comes to infill building like this. I like I almost want to cut out in a square the very center of the building so that all of the units are opening up into a center where there's a big skylight with light coming down where each floor can have a little garden room with natural light that comes down from above or something something creative like that. Um, if it's gonna be a green building, I, I guess I think that, but um, so those are a few of my thoughts and thank you so much for the presentation. You're very welcome. I, I don't have perfect answers for you, Gwen. I feel like we can't always get everything. Um, what we get in this location is the high level of walkability and bus and bike trail and electric bike access. We don't get gardening space with probably the exception of there is a balcony that's pretty good size that's up on the fifth floor of the building that'll be available to all the residents. You so, know, uh, even a roof garden, even, yeah. I mean, they're starting to do yeah. this to fix nitrogen yeah. and fix and fix carbon yeah. into the roofs, okay. Yeah. We can definitely do a roof garden. I mean, part of the quandary that we have is, for example, Sergeant House actually has a, a good sized backyard, but no one is gardening. <laughs> so, it, you know, you can build things and people don't use them, then you don't have them and people want them. It's, it's a little challenging. I would say, just like anybody who's got a job in downtown, you find parking. Northampton does not have, as far as I know, and Keith can back me up, a shortage of downtown parking. There's actually a lot that sits empty. And there's even free parking if you're willing to walk a few blocks. Um, so again, it's it's always trade-offs. Um, we just have so few people who own cars and someone with a car may not choose to live at this location. And that's the other thing. It's like, you don't have to live here. Um, it's really about people who want that downtown location. I mean, Live 155, which is uh, a block away, is 70 units, no parking. So, and people don't complain, people like it. They like living there, they make arrangements. All right, thank you, thank you, Laura. So we need to move on. Gordon, I think you had your hand up for a while and I'm not sure exactly who else did, but I know you did. Yeah, I see Ace has her hand up, which I guess she's after me. But I just want to—I okay. have a few, I have a couple of process questions, but I just want to circle back to um, the issue that um, Jade is raising with you know with uh, what really comes down to is an echo what Laura said, which is the it really comes down to management and enforcement. I mean, you these tendencies I'm assuming will have leases, and leases have rules on who can occupy and and how many get you know how long a guest can 
can stay. Uh, it's pretty standard yeah. stuff. Um, you know, I just want to say, you know, don't let the, the perfect be the enemy of the good, because this is a, this is a very exciting and well needed project. And I know you agree with that, Jada, but it's, you know, what what the what the issue that you raise really underscores is the fact that if someone is, you know, unauthorized occupying with the uh, with the uh, authorized tenant, it's probably because they're homeless as well. And so, so this just speaks to the need is again that you know those people are there because out of necessity, not because they you know they they you know it's there's no other other explanation other than necessity, you know I'm I represent tenants all the time defending them from having guests that overstay their welcome. It's always comes out down to I what it's a Hobson choice. Am I going to let my child live on the streets when it's you know 20 degrees outside? I'm going to let them stay in. I'm going to take the risk. So it's really about an enforcement. But the questions I have, Laura, really are a process related. So you mentioned that there are going to be project-based subsidies. Um, and are they already secured? And where are they coming from? That's question number one. And I guess that the, the, it sort of feeds into the next question, which is uh, funding for this. Where is it coming from? And, and what is your timeline for development? So, I know you've got the five-year five, five -year window to get things rolling. but Right, right. But more so, specifically, <laughs> yeah. So um, we would our goal would be to get twenty uh, project based vouchers, probably a combination of Section Eights and MRBPs. Uh, they would either come from the Northampton Housing Authority. We would always ask them first, um, and then if they didn't have them available to project base, we would ask the state. What used to be DHCD Department of Housing and Community Development, now it's an Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. We would ask them an and unpronounceable it, acronym. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we would ask them at the same time that we're going in to request capital financing. Um, and I think uh, it, these are always probably the longest kind of period is raising capital for the projects. So right now we're at the kind of preliminary design. We uh, anticipate going before the planning board, hopefully later this summer that rolls along, we get our permit. I think it's probably fall of next year that we make our first kind of big ask uh, to the state for financing. And part of the reason that's a bit of time away is that we just got financing for 23 Laurel Street, like just. So that's 20 townhouses that are gonna go under construction in the spring. We did get money for the old Northampton nursing home, but we were invited to go back in this summer. And that's a whale of a project that needs a lot of money. So we are kind of trying to stagger our requests to the state because they only have so much and they're only going to give so much to Northampton. So this is kind of coming in our pipeline queue behind Laurel Street, behind Prospect Place, which is the old nursing home. This one would come next. Um, it's going to be an expensive on a per, per square foot basis. It's not a huge building, but because of the location and because of wanting it to look like a kind of not historic, but compatible with downtown historic buildings um, and just the incredible escalation in construction costs, it's gonna drive our number up. And Ace, you had said, what happened to the one bedrooms? That is what happened to the one bedrooms. So we initially wanted to have a blend of studios and one bedrooms. Um, but when you do that with a very constricted site like this, you just have less units. And what we find is there is a crushing demand from single person, extremely low income households. No matter what we put out there and people apply for, that is where the greatest demand is. And so we can do, you know, three studios for every two one bedrooms. You know, it just, it's a, it's a numbers issue for how many households, how many people can we accommodate at this location? And how can we raise the ginormous amount of money that it's costing these days um, to build it? So I saw your, your question in the chat. I know you have your hand up. I don't know if you have other questions. Oh, you're on mute. That was one of them. Um, yep. The other two uh, I did also put in the chat, but I'll reiterate here. Um, so regarding the area media income, it is 30% of the area media income. What is that the number that the area medium income is? Is right. it, you know, 50K? Is it more? Is it less? Right. What's that number we're taking 30% of? So uh, the area median income 
for the, the, the highest for a single person household at 30% AMI is just over $20,000. The reality is a lot of people make a lot less than that, especially if they're living on like social security, their retired disability income, they might make 11 or $12,000. That's why we always try to pair those units with the project-based vouchers because that's, that's the no man's land. I mean, you cannot participate in the private rental market if your income is 11 or $12,000 a year. It just is not possible. Um, and then the 60% AMI was, I forget, it was in the presentation, it was 40, do you remember, Keith, it was 40? I mean, 40 would be double 40, 40 uh, something what thousand. 30% was, so. That, 40 something uh, thousand. Um, that checks so mathematically. Those folks, um, again, and it'll be a range. I mean, you could have anybody from 21,000 up to whatever that top number is. And so with those rents, they'll be below market rents. The other thing that we do is we include utilities and rent. Um, so pray for us. Um, we include utilities and rent because that's been a huge issue uh, for mm -hmm. low-income tenants. It's a huge issue for us as landlords too. Uh, utility costs have been kind of bonkers. And so yeah. it's it's putting a lot of pressure on um, low-income households to be able to afford utilities. I did see that there appear to be solar plans. So hopefully that will help with electricity at the very yeah. least. I mean, it's a tall building with not a huge roof. It'll help. And the passive house construction will help um, keep those utility costs down. Um, when you go all electric, you get very efficient systems, but electricity is very expensive. So, you know, we're looking actually at geothermal at another property and the city may do some geothermal at this downtown location. But for now, we're we're on the grid and defraying that a little bit with with the PV panels. Um, and my last question is following up on my earlier question about parking. Uh, while I do agree that city parking does exist, it does tend to be at a premium. Um, and as robust as the as the bus system is during the school year, the reality is uh, that if residents don't have a job within walking distance. I can't speak to the bus's reliability in actually getting there, uh, and I can definitely see a stumbling block with residents being, you know, getting that car to get the job that they need to have yeah. to continue, uh, and I hope that every effort is being taken to, uh, for example, subsidize parking costs, because it may only be a few dollars, but uh, that can be a absolutely huge difference to, you know, yeah. folks making less than 20k a year. I think that it won't affect many people, but I think it's a point well taken and we can certainly talk with the city. Maybe we can maybe we can work something out with the long-term parking behind the roundhouse. Um I think the city just um in general wants to encourage people to use alternative transit rather I mean they they'd like to subsidize bus passes and bike shares and things like that. I think before words in your mouth, Keith, before they might want to subsidize private vehicle, private vehicle parking. Um, I 100% I agree. Talk about that. And, well, and the reality of the busing yes. and the loss yes. of no, the bike I systems. I hear you. <laughs> it's an imperfect world, for can sure. I, can I Thanks. just interject here for a moment? Um, so, Laura, I didn't catch when are you potentially going to start construction? Because I think we're talking about we're going to hear about this project more. I know it's in the planning stages, so these questions are important in, in formulating ideas and reshaping yep. things, but yep. what year is that? So if we, I think we're at probably 2026 before we would see any kind of actual construction on the site, and it could be later than that. Um, we're having a lot of questions about whether it will coincide with the Main Street redevelopment, and the true answer is we're not it could, but we're not sure. We might be coming after that work is done. We don't really know. Okay, thank you. So does anybody who hasn't spoken yet have a question before I call on you, Gwen? Anybody else? Am I missing anybody? You know how I do that. Okay, Gwen. And then we also have a lot of other agenda items, so we need to start wrapping this up. Okay, so um, my one last question is, um, I remember you talking about a management company that would be managing Bridge Road. Yep. And so why would you not maybe access that company for this as well? 
We would. Okay. Yeah. So they're they're called housing management resources. They manage all of our portfolio of properties in okay. Northampton, Amherst. Okay. So yeah, that's their specialty. Um, but in addition to that, which we do at other properties, we'd want to have a resident services coordinator who's more of a connector with services, not just kind of a property manager. Um, and before I forget, I just want to throw out for folks, you may have read about the East Gables project that Valley's building. It's 28 small studio units right near Amherst College in Amherst. So we have 28. We uh, just did the lottery for those uh, apartments and I'll get you more detailed data, but what I can tell you is we had 501 applications for those apartments and probably 200 were from people who did not have current housing. So the numbers are just not going down. Yeah. Um, Laura, my question is, what do you need from the housing partnership now? So um, at some point, it would be wonderful if the partnership was willing and wanted to write a letter of support for us. Um, we would take that and when we go into before the planning board, for example, we would bring that to show that we had already talked with this board and that you guys were in support. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Great. I just have one other quick comment, and that is this project sounds a lot like independent housing solutions at 5 Franklin Street. Um, I know that's private. Um, we just don't hear anything about them at all, but um, I didn't know if you had a comment about that. Um, I think it's a little bit different. I think the model's a little different. Um, you know, we would hope to work a bit with Dr. Bossy because she's great at providing supports for tenants I mean, in different situations. And she comes to our other properties in Florence, the Go West Building and North Maple. Um, but yeah, the funding stream, we're, we're gonna use a lot of public money so they kind of went a different route to try to not use public money with that development. And they're really looking at people with kind of severe medical challenges. And we're just not equipped to kind of specialize necessarily in that in that group of folks. So this okay. is much, this is broader. Thank you so much for- You're welcome. Um, um, my neighbor just turned on his huge lawnmower. Are people bothered? Do you hear that background noise? Okay, good. Anyway, Laura, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. You're very um, welcome. Thank you for the yeah. opportunity. And um, all right, great. And you're of course welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, but yeah, I don't I think know. I will. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, let's go on to other agenda items. First of all, we need to talk about the minutes. Um, Keith, did you want to say something or I'm? Yeah, I don't need to say anything. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so let's go on to the I minutes. move to approve the minutes as submitted. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. I'll second. All right. Does anybody oppose? Everybody who agrees with that, raise your hand, please. Hannah? Okay, it's unanimous that we approve the minutes from June 5th. Thank you. Um, so on to agenda item number five, follow-up discussion regarding housing at the Northampton launch meeting on June 13th. I wish um, Hannah and Gwen, I had emailed you beforehand to ask you to sum this up, but here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say, just a few, just a summary about this, and I'd love it if you have something to add. And then, of course, Keith, we will turn to you for for other updates. Okay. Um, so on June thirteenth, we had this meeting with the chap of folks. It was quite well attended. I don't know exactly how many people, but maybe at least sixty or so people were in the room. I think, and quite a few on Zoom. Um, I thought. You know, this is just a really brief summary. I thought that um, it could have been a more robust discussion. I thought that there was a lot of time at the beginning for putting 
ideas on sticky on uh, sticky notes on tabs of um, sort of more general ideas. Um, I think it was to stimulate conversation. Um, but I wish that there had been more time for people in the room to have their comments heard. The other thing um, I felt was that um, they did a really good job of, uh, of um, presenting Northampton demographic data, including population, population uh, differences over decades, et cetera, housing development, housing, um, housing usage over decades and how that's changed. One thing I thought was left out and I, I was disappointed in this was anything about construction costs. So we, I mean, basically we have housing for the wealthy and we have affordable housing that's created by people like Valley CDC and other agencies. Um, so I thought that was a missing middle. In any case, there's gonna hopefully be other meetings. So these can all have some momentum and they don't all need to be addressed. I am just simply giving you my perspective of things. Hannah, do you have do you have anything that you want to add from your perspective being an in-person attender? Yeah, you know, I think one thing that uh, I mean there were there were things that I learned and got out of it and you know, I mean, seeing the costs of housing in Northampton is always like, I mean, it shouldn't be sticker shock at this point, but it's like it's a crisis here. Um, the the one thing that I thought was kind of a missed opportunity at the meeting that I would love to see at the next one is that I wanted to have a better sense of like who was in the room who's already doing work. Um, like I felt like it would have been awesome for, you know, to know like who's from Valley CDC, who's what does the housing partnership do? Um, I think there was even, a, I don't know if it was Keith at the beginning, like somebody had made a comment at the beginning of the meeting, like, oh, we're all so siloed. And I think that that's true. And that was the one thing that I really wanted to see and leave the meeting, like knowing that I had new connections and people to talk to. Um, but I mean, I was really glad to be able to attend. That's a really good point. I think some missed opportunities there. Thanks, Hannah. Gwen, do you want to add add some comments as an attender, in-person attender? Well, it gave me a lot of hope that so many people showed up. Um, I saw a couple folks from Wayfinders, um, you know, because I've met them in previous lives doing other things. Um, but I, I agreed with Hannah that it would have been great for us to have more time sort of talking about who is at the table, um, you know, where they're coming from, what their interest was. Um, and, um, and I mean, I guess, you know, it was kind of like, I was like, okay, what's next? And then, um, you know, like what, what came out of that is, is a group of people. So I'm curious about how that is and, and how the housing partnership works in conjunction with that group. And, and how it unfolds. But overall, I would say like doing the stickers and stuff like that early on was a little bit chaotic. Um, it also kind of like was very crowded for that to happen. So I think it would have been, it could have been done in a different way, but I, I was happy to see the, the statistics. And um, I felt like one thing missing was the population of minority groups um, in the statistics. And so I felt very strongly that that was missing. Thanks. Thanks, Gwen. Was anybody who was online wanted to make a comment before we go to Keith? Joella? You know, it's interesting because just so happened with all the changes, it was from public and then change and the time change. So I felt like something happened early on when they went around and talked amongst themselves that I felt like I wasn't a privy to. And uh, but I was happy when I said, uh, you know, I'm here at this thing and they even announced it. So I, I think we're, maybe if you were there, it was a little different, but from somebody observing or online, it felt very, it was like their way of trying to make it inclusive. So I appreciate that. Yeah, I, the, the thing is I couldn't hear very well, I have to tell you. I couldn't hear the speaker and she was dynamic. It was like in a black church in the South. She was gone on, <laughs> and I was like, I wanna hear, I wanna hear. So I didn't get to hear very much, but I was like, please continue something like this. Do it again. You know, have it recorded so people who couldn't hear very well, we can come see it. I mean, I want it more, more, more. So I want to just thank you guys for doing that. It was amazing. I just happened to have two other meetings that 
I'm on the, and I and I couldn't hear very well. So thanks, Joella. Thank you very much. Anybody else who was online want to make a comment at all? Melissa? Yep. Hi. I I'd hoped to attend in person, but I was running late and uh was happy that there was a Zoom option. So I was online and um I um, you know, I I was impressed with how well it was attended. Um, it was definitely very dynamic. Um, and I I in, in the demographic information very thorough. Thought it was a good presentation, but I there are um you know, there's a lot more to follow that. Um, and I think that um it, I think that's a lot of the the folks in the city that hmm, have um, strong opinions were there and were happy to be there and were encouraged by what they heard. And I'm hoping that that's going to help bring. Um, you know, us together more in this effort. So I, I think it was a good step, a good foot forward is how I felt uh, listening. So. Uh, okay. Thank you. So, um, oh, Richard. Yes, I thought it was a good presentation and there was only one thing that I thought was a missed opportunity that I wanted to bring up, which is, you know, we have a public education component to our work, and I'm really glad that there is parallel interest of people in the community who are interested in housing issues. But I think we missed an opportunity to remind and speak to the role that we have had ongoing for decades as a group that has been advocating and working and producing affordable housing. And it sounded you know, if you didn't know anything about the housing partnership to people who were there, that there really hasn't been much and they've got to go from the ground up. And I think they can work parallel and do other things. But I think we missed a, an outreach opportunity and, and uh, our obligation to present the full picture by not having some better presentation about what the partnership does. Hey, okay, thanks, Richard. So, Keith. I want to turn to you um, because obviously a lot of comments here are, let's keep this going. How are we going to proceed? And first say to you that you, you applied for this grant. Um, I, I, I want to thank you very much for doing that. I know you put a lot of hard work into this. There was a lot going on when we did this presentation or, or when you, um, you know, facilitated this discussion essentially. Um, and um, it was the first time some of us had met in person. So there was, there, there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of stimulus. But anyway, I wanted to say thank you, Keith. And could you bring us up to date on future, um, or on how future meetings are developing? Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of good comments. I'm taking this down. Um, and some of the people that have emailed me after, right after the meeting, or I did a follow-up email, they've already started to bring up some of the stuff. Uh, and, you know, I was, uh, I didn't even um, introduce myself, so I was kind of all over the place. So uh, I think there's definitely some opportunity there um, for, you know, telling about the housing partnership story. And, um, you know, I had a follow-up meeting with CHAPA, and, you know, one of the things that I brought to them is like, you know, who's missing from the room? And if you looked around, it's like renters, people of color, immigrants, people who have English as a second language. So, you know, we're already starting to think about what the meeting, next meeting looks like and how we can get them in the room. So uh, one of the ideas floated during the meeting was having the meeting somewhere else, like at a housing authority property or another apartment complex. Um, maybe this complex that has a higher percentage of, you know, uh, Spanish speaking people, things like that. Um, so Chapa's, um, they, that's a good uh, direction. Uh, I'm starting thinking about how instead of having it at this time, maybe a different time or a different location, 
um, and maybe offering uh, translation services and having the flyers or the emails go out in Spanish or French or something like that. Um, so the next meeting, uh, you know, I would say that generally there was a lot of positive energy. Uh, and as Melissa said, there are some people that are um, very vocal uh, and um, maybe maybe the comments are uh, directed in a in a in this kind of positive event. Um, but happy to see them there and to be involved. Uh, so we're thinking uh, September ish will be the next meeting. Uh, I'm going to be getting with the kind of the um, uh, steering committee. Steering committee. Yeah. Uh, but really, you know, I don't want this to seem like this is closed. The idea is that we would slowly start to, you know, that this thing would take on a life of its own. Um, so al although I'm doing a lot of coordinating now, um, you know, it'd be great if anyone wanted to help facilitate the meeting or to do re outreach or things like that. That this could become a a Northampton community kind of driven thing, um, and if there's someone within within the housing partnership that is involved in that, it'd be really good. Um, so, yeah, I I have uh, a bunch of emails from everyone or their contacts, and I'll be following up with everyone. Uh, I got a survey out there, and there's some already some good feedback about the meeting, so I'll be incorporating that in. Um, but I, I, I don't want um, the housing partnership to feel that this is a kind of a, a closed thing, you know, so if you want to be more involved, let me know. Um, and I don't want you to overcommit that if you say yes to it, you're going to be doing it forever or something like that. But these comments are helpful for me. Um, as a facilitator, I'm up there, but I was also in technology stuff. So my, my filter was very just broken that day. Um, there was so much going on. And the other thing I just wanted to interject, Keith, is one thing I asked Keith was, or I clarified with Keith was, so this community group that we hope is going to get up and start to gallop is going to be a lot more, more nimble than the housing partnership. We are, we are an official city committee. We, uh, we have minutes, we have agenda. We have agendas, they have to be um, put online and publicized. Um, this um, group, and Keith, maybe you could speak to this just briefly, um, will be a lot more nimble in terms of the advocacy and the type of things that they can do because they don't have to adhere to some of the fine print that we have to adhere to. Yeah, that's right? cool. Yeah. All right. So are there any other questions or comments? I mean, we will, I'm gonna keep the housing a partnership updated on when the steering committee meets, because I feel like anybody can join the steering committee, right, Keith? Yeah, I would say that's uh, from the housing partnership. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, from the housing partnership, yeah. All right, everybody, thank you so much for, for attending, for saying hello to each other. Thank you, Keith, and for those who were online. All right, now we come to the most exciting, um, Agenda item of all, voting for officers. We've been talking about this for months. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna kind of put it out there. The proposed slate is for me to continue as chair and Edgardo to be vice chair. I know about last year, um, I had said to people that I wouldn't um, be chair for more than another year, which would end around now. I really, over the last few months have thought a lot about that and um, as I have become more comfortable with facilitating, especially online, which has been really a challenge for me, um, I see that there's so much institutional knowledge that is carried along. And I um, just thought, well, I will just continue for the time being. So that's, that's been my change, of, my change of heart, and that's the reason why. Um, Edgar, do you want to say a few words in your campaign speech? Uh, sure. There? Yeah, um, well, I have uh, been part of the partnership uh, for a few years now. I say probably since 2018, I want to say 2017. 
Um, and uh, I have, um, I've always felt um, sort of uh, like my input has uh, been uh, valued and, uh, and heard. And I've been, uh, I've been really proud of uh, some of the projects that we've uh, taken on, uh, particularly the, um, uh, the report that we wrote as a group uh, in collaboration with the Pioneer Valley uh, Planning Commission and um and playground uh at hampshire heights and um i really see the opportunity for us to continue to have an impact on creating or maintaining uh, affordable housing uh in and, and, and uh, being sort of a connection between the housing world uh and our in our community and um i'm i'm always willing to uh serve however i can uh, but one thing I know for sure is that I'm always going to be involved with anything housing related. Um, and by the way, it was exciting to hear the presentation earlier because I've been housed by Valley CDC as a younger person uh, who, didn't, who didn't have a place to stay at the time. I uh, was uh, a tenant at uh, 16 North Maple Street in Florence when it was uh, SROs and um, from there, I was invited to be on the board of Valley CDC, served on the board, and really Valley CDC helped me uh, to get into um, uh, anything related housing. So I'm very thankful for Valley CDC on a personal level, but also for the continued work that they do in the, in the community. So today is actually, uh, was sort of uh, sweet, just to kind of see a lot of things come back in full circle. And like I said, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to serve however I can. And and thank you, thank you, Edgar. And also let me say that um, we are running unopposed. So I'm not sure how to do the vote. I wish somebody else would do that instead of me. Uh, I move that we uh, vote to have Carmen continue to serve as president for the next year and Edgardo to serve, excuse me, as chair and Edgardo to serve as vice chair with the sincere appreciation of all the members for your willingness to do work on our behalf. I second that. Thank you. Um, Thank you for serving, both of you. Okay. Is anybody opposed? Can we, can like we do a, a roll call vote, actually, please? Okay. Uh, Melissa? Yep. Hannah? Ace. Yes. Gordon. Yes. Gwen. Yes. Richard. Yes. Uh, you Edgardo get the vote for yourself. <laughs> yes. I'm a yes, and I think Edgardo's a yes, too. Yes. Yes. All right. Let it be said that we will be a team, Edgar, and continue on. Thank you very much, everybody. All right, so let's race through the next few agenda items. Um, we're almost done here. Keith, you wanted to just say a few words about Northampton Housing Authority taking over the East Hampton Housing Authority in terms of management. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, Housing Authority, put a, they responded to a RFP or something. I think it's a three-year contract. Um, East Hampton Housing Authority, I, um, how many units? I think it's like 60 or 70 or something. Um, so I don't know how that's going to affect the Northampton House Authority, but I just want to uh, put it on you know, radar um, and it could affect management or something like that. So. Thanks, Keith. Um, okay. Um, Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Fund update. Update, Hannah? I mean, yeah, I can give just, it just seemed, you know, I must say, it just seemed so clear to me from Laura Baker's presentation around all the money that's needed that, you know, why is there this sort of stalemate? Anyway, go ahead, Hannah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, that's, that's okay. Uh, I'll just give a brief update because um, we've had we've had a few misses in terms of scheduling and I think that it's just proving that you know summer is like despite everybody's best efforts 
summer is just a really hard time to get more meetings in. Um, so the the few things that I will say is that, you know, our next step we decided is that what we really need is like a time to all get together as a working group. Like what we haven't really had a chance to do is like get together in a room with a bunch of like printouts from Arlington's five-year plan for their affordable housing trust fund, Somerville's uh, affordable housing trust fund, and like look through and just collate some notes. So um, that's the next thing that we want to do. And I, at the end, I'll just ask a practical question of like how how do we do that? And is that okay to do? Um, like, how do we just get together and talk with some papers? Um, uh, like, I don't know <laughs> if we have to be having that as an open meeting. Like, that's just, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but, you know, just in terms of what I've looked at, uh, there's like, we're, we're just right in line with what a lot of other towns and cities in Massachusetts are doing, like in terms of thinking about funding affordable housing trust fund with um, real estate transfer fees. There are other towns right now who are working on short-term rental taxes. So I feel like we're sort of like moving along in a, a, a soup of good work that's being done. And like there's the potential for a lot of mutual support. Um, so what we really need right now is just to all get together and like put our heads together and get some notes. Um, so knowing that we'll be not meeting in August for the housing partnership, I'm hoping maybe the subcommittee can get together like end of August before the September meeting um, and have, have our working group meeting then. And Hannah, you ask, a, I think a really crucial question, you know, is it, is it okay? Is it, is it, is it like within the law to get together as a working group without putting out an agenda and the time and everything. And I mean, I had an informal conversation with Alex Jarrett recently in which he actually brought this up around another group that this is perfectly fine as long as it's not quorum. But Keith, you I think have had some other ideas about needing to keep this formal and with an agenda, et cetera. I mean, I think, um, you know, there's, two things, one, meeting the quorum requirement, and then two, allowing the public to be part of that. So, I mean, the subcommittee may never meet quorum, I doubt they will, but, no. um, you know, it. I think it's best practice in, in the Massachusetts guide, it says, you know, it's a better practice, but, um, you know, if, um, um, you know, if it's something that, that oh, all of a sudden you guys are going to meet, then you can do it. But if you know ahead of time you're going to meet, then I would appreciate being able to post it so anyone who's in, in, who is interested in going to that meeting can go. Um, yeah. Just as a follow up question, Keith, um, in that case, like where does a meeting like that have to to happen? Like if we're going to be meet, meeting in person, is there like a room that we could use? Um, yeah, I mean, if it's during business hours, uh, you can do it at the hearing room or council chambers. You know, you just need to let me know so I can do a request. Um, okay. But, you know, I think in the interest of if we're doing it posted, then, you know, it would be best to have it accessible. So, uh, you know, for people with wheelchairs, but um, any, any place public, I don't, you know, the library, anything like that. Okay, anything else, Hannah? Uh, I think, you know, the only other thing is that the when I was looking through the city of Arlington's five-year plan for their affordable housing trust fund, um, one of the things that they did was conduct a number of targeted listening sessions in the community. And something that I was thinking was that, you know, the uh, affordable housing study that the City or that the housing partnership housing partnership did in partnership was it with Valley CDC or was it anyway affordable housing study was done in 2019 since then we've had a pandemic uh, and I was thinking that you know while we don't need to do something of that scope again that it might be really good as part of the 
getting this affordable housing trust fund going to host some listening sessions with the community, uh, like in September, or October. Um, I think that a lot of people would come out for them. So that's all. Okay, thank you, Hannah. Um, okay, are we gonna go on to other business when, or are you commenting on Hannah? Or are you commenting just, on the um, Affordable Housing Trust Committee? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. So um, I was just gonna say that August is my last month before I won't be here for a little, a short while. I'm taking a short leave of absence. So, um, you know, like if it's late in August, you know, I can try to make it, but it will depend on how we coordinate. And so, yeah, it's, and I agree with the listening sessions. I think that would be a great idea. All right, thank you, Gwen. All right, so let's wrap up. First of all, is there, is there other business that we have to schedule September's meeting, but is there other business now not anticipated that somebody wants to make a brief statement about? Hannah? Sorry for talking so much. I did. I just wanted to update briefly on the um, broker fee home rule petition because there was just an update on the uh, uh, government website. They have scheduled the hearing for um, July 11th from 1 to 4 p.m. So that's like next week. I don't know how that works. I don't know if like if people are supposed to attend, but um, I did just want to give that update. Thanks, Hannah. All right. So let's move on and let's close out the meeting. Um, Keith, you have your next scheduled meeting is Monday, September 4th. That's Labor Day. And I really feel like we need to move that up to the 11th. Okay, so September 11th, got it. People all right with that? I mean, to me, Labor Day is the last day of the summer and I will be in no mindset to, you know, we need, get things moving again, I think. Edgardo agrees with that, great. So we won't, we won't meet again for two months. Um, and um, yes, and have a nice summer, everybody. Any other final comments? Goodbye. Motion Bye, to adjourn. <laughs>